Hi, welcome to Father Sun Galaxy. I'm Kerwin. After the cancellation of the Acolyte, Star Wars' future seems uncertain. Skeleton Crew arrives on Disney Plus in December, and for now, Andor Season 2 is the only Star Wars series scheduled for release on the streaming service in 2025. Where does Star Wars go from here? We will discuss our ideas along with our guest, Kyra Neverat of Relatable Nerds, a nerdy pop culture podcast that covers film and television from the MCU, Indian cinema, DC, Star Wars, and everything in between. Kyra, welcome to Father Sun Galaxy. Thank you. Back. I missed you guys so much. It's so good to be back. And I can't wait. That introduction got me excited to talk about the accolade. I forgot that Skeleton Crew is on the horizon as well. There's so many things to like balance right now with all the shows and movies. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I, I should correct myself. I should say welcome back to Father Sun Galaxy because you, okay. you've already been here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Yeah. The last time we saw each other in person was a year ago. We went to Fan Expo Chicago in 23. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we missed going this year. But you went, you and, and Ilsa, uh, your co-host of Relatable Nerds, yeah. had a panel. So tell me about Chicago Expo. How did it go? Oh, it was amazing per usual. Um, I love Fan Expo so much. They've been so incredibly generous to our podcast. And they've always given us a platform without hesitation. And we've been doing it for the past couple years now. And it's just, it's always a delight to do it. I look forward to it every single year. Um, unfortunately, this year, it was kind of a slower year for us in terms of going to Fan Expo and going to some of the shows. Um, last year, I think we hit Boston, Philly, San Francisco, Chicago. So it was like a coast to coast tour almost. It felt like for a little bit, but Chicago was home. So it felt really special to have that hometown show again. Um, it was, it was like a month to the day now. I think it was, yeah, like last month, August, kind of in the beginning of the month. Um, it was a great show. Now they did put us on Saturday at noon, which if you've been to a comic con, you know, that's like a prime time show, like show time to have everybody's there. Nobody's really working. And it was just a lot of traffic that day. I feel like this show was so like, there's so many more people than I've seen in previous years. So that was really, really cool. Um, now for our show, you didn't have to like buy tickets or anything, but just to say, to describe it, it felt like a sold out crowd. There weren't really that many empty seats. I was kind of surprised because we did a little promo, but like, like I said, it's been kind of more of a lax year for us in terms of the conventions. We've been more focused on our YouTube and stuff like that, but the show was amazing. Great turnout. Uh, the fans at Fan Expo, they're just, they're great people. They're super fans just like us. And every time we have a show there, we connect with so many more new people and, everybody just nerds out. It's like a really good time. You know, you feel like you're amongst your people, the same nerds that you wish you could see every day, you know, walking down the hallways of work or something like that. So it was a really great show. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I go to these cons, uh, I feel like I fit in, you know, like these are my people, you know, I can nerd out. I don't need to be ashamed of what I love and I can talk about it and, and smile and find other people who enjoy what I enjoy. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, like I, I missed being there this year. And um, so I was wondering, you know, comparing 24 to last year, were you still on the creator stage? Did they have the creator stage set up the same as they did last year? So um, they had a change in management, I think, for the creator stage. So there were like some small minor differences. Um, I will say this uh, stage was right in the middle of everything. So it wasn't like in a panel room as some of the shows had been before. So that was really cool because it was just so much traffic and people able to walk up and hear us. And um, yeah, it was it was more or less the same. I wouldn't say the stage had uh, as many frills as Chuck and Shauna like to put on in the previous shows because, you know, they just go above and beyond. But it was it was still, it was a perfect setting, perfect stage. They had the microphones. They had everything we needed. So, yeah, I would say it was more or less the same kind of vibe, you know? Nice, yeah. Now, as far as celebrities, um, 
I know last year Star Wars represented, you know, there was a big turnout of, of celebrities, voice actors. Uh, a lot of them came out last year. I, this year, I'm not sure who was there, but I do know Mark Hamill was there because I yes. saw in your Instagram post, you took a photo with him, which looked pretty cool. Yeah, so that was actually, he was at the one in Chicago. Um, I met him in San Francisco last year. But I feel like the one in San Francisco was like the first show he's done in like years. So people were freaking out, myself included. Um, it was it was a pretty hefty price tag too. I my boyfriend purchased it for me as like an early Christmas gift. I was crying. I couldn't even I still can't believe that moment happened. Cause you know, they say when you meet your heroes, right? It can go one of two ways. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, there's Luke Skywalker. You're gonna be like, ah, oh, that was underwhelming. But it was exactly what you would expect it to be. He's like the kindest person ever. He was just so generous and kind and just smiling. And, you know, he he's getting up there. I think he's in his 70s. And he was just a delight the whole time for how, because, you know, they, I wouldn't say they overbook his autographs or his pictures, but he is just like on the clock for like three days in a row. So I can imagine that's exhausting. But um, he was at the Chicago one as well. I didn't meet him in this one. I think I'm probably only going to get that one chance, and I'm glad I did. That'll be it for history. But um, Hayden Christensen was there as well. Rosario Dawson. Um, yeah, I think there was a couple other ones. There might have been um, a couple people from Ahsoka, too. I think um, – I forget his name – who plays um, – Gosh, now I'm blinking. Oh my gosh, he's an Ahsoka. He's like one of my favorite characters. How am I blinking on his name? Um, he was there. There was a couple other like voice actors. I think Ashley Eckstein was there as well, which I feel like she does most of the conventions. She's also very booked with all those. But yeah, I think it was a good good Star Wars turnout overall. Yeah. yeah. What I like about the convention center is the Donald Stevens Convention Center, right? And it's not in Chicago is in Rosemont, so it's right outside of Chicago, but it's a beautiful building. It's huge. And when I went there, that was our first time going to the convention center. What I love the most is that they have this bridge or walkway. I don't know exactly what you call it that connects from that connects the, the garage to the convention center. So all yeah. you have to do is park your car and just walk across the bridge to the convention yeah. center. And you just walk in and then you're there. Yeah, I, yeah, that other works. Bridge walkway. Yeah, that is really yeah. convenient. I believe I saw because I'm in a couple groups. I think there was something happened where they like stopped letting people go through that way because oh. it's such a massive place just for like a couple days, I think. But um, there was another convention because they have like a second and a third floor, I think. And there was another like medical convention or something else going on. And I think those people were like getting upset because they were seeing all like. Darth Vader's and all the people coming through. It was kind of like poo-pooing their whole organization. Uh -huh. And people were probably very confused. But um, yeah, no, that is super convenient. I mean, I, Chicago gets really cold with snow too. If they ever were to have one in the winter, that would be like perfect, you know? Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I hope I can be there next year. But like you said, um, same thing happened with us. We were actually, that's where we, we were, we saw you in Boston and yeah. in Chicago last year. We were also in Philadelphia and you're mm -hmm. right. And we did go to multiple cities last year, but this year we kept it, uh, you know, because we, when we bought a home, um, you know, we just kept it, you know, to, a, to a minimum. So we did attend the Philadelphia expo. Um, and then the one in, um, Actually, that was it. It was just, yeah, so it, only one expo this year, and that was the one in Philadelphia. So um, yeah, so hopefully yeah. next year we'll we'll be able to pick it up, pick it right back yeah, up. Yeah, for sure. I feel like we were on the same page with that because I moved as well. So it was kind of like that slow year, you know? But next year we're, we're going to be on more shows for sure. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, when we were talking about doing this episode, um, you know, we talked about a topic. Um you know what's been going on, you know, if you're following social media and what's been happening with Star Wars. I, I kind of feel like we're back in 2019 um, around the rise of Skywalker, where I mean, even go further back to 2017, the, uh, the Last Jedi, where, you know, when that movie came out, it split the fan base. I mean, right down the middle. Um, and then we were hoping that 2019, the rise of Skywalker was going to bring everybody back to center and 
everyone was going to love this film and enjoy this film. And that was not the case. Um, and that was the time when Disney started their streaming service, Disney Plus, And that was the first year that The Mandalorian first season came out. And that was a massive success. And then he said, OK, well, let's let's do this again. And they came up with other series that, you know, depending on your taste, you know, some of them were good. Some of them may uh, may have been better. Um, but now here's the acolyte. And I think something different happened this time around. Uh, and uh, maybe you can you and I can and can talk about exactly what happened. But it just seems that this series split us right down the middle once again. Um, and. Yeah, and I, I, I'm thinking that it may have something to do with um, the hype that was behind it. Um, you know, the, 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 the promotion that Disney and Lucasfilm was putting behind the show, they really wanted the show to succeed. And when it fell short and it didn't meet expectations, um, I think the fans were surprised. I think Disney was surprised and they did what you would expect, a, um, you know, a a production company to do, you know, if you have a show that no one is watching and costs a lot of money, they canceled it. So um, what do you, how do you feel about the state of Star Wars right now? I have so many different things I want to say initially, but I think I'm always going to be excited about Star Wars, no matter the circumstance. And I think that's just because I'm one of those people that I, you know, a lot of us grew up with it, right? And I see myself in so many different viewpoints of people watching Star Wars. And I see myself as a young person watching Star Wars, a kid. I see myself as a teenager, as an adult now. And I see myself 10 years, the rest of my life watching it, right? And I think no matter what happens, we're all going to look back at this time and kind of going to be like, why was everybody so upset over something, nothing be over something we can't control, you know? And I think the state of Star Wars, the fans really do, they really do ruin some of the stuff sometimes, the vibes, the just the happiness of the show and just getting excited about it. And I think it goes back to almost just, when I was a kid, I would sometimes get bullied for liking Star Wars, you know, and people would just have their opinions about it no matter what. And I feel like that's unfortunately a part of life. But when it is like Star Wars fans that you know and that you're friends with or family and everybody has all these different opinions and everybody starts fighting and words are exchanged on the internet, it's just like, why? I like, I remember when the prequels were done back in the day and I remember being this like 11 year old kid, like what's next? Like, why don't we have anything, you know? Or like, that's it. Kind of like the end of, you know, an era. We did get the Clone Wars, right? But there was never any live action or anything. So I always look at it from the perspective of I'm grateful that there's any Star Wars. I'm grateful that there's so many people that are interested and invested in telling these stories. And despite all of the discourse online and everything, at the end of the day, I think we all need to remember that there's so many different brilliant minds and peoples and creators and artists that are putting so much time and effort into these shows, into these stories, into the comics, into the books, the movies, that nobody would sign on to a project if they thought they were going to hurt a fan base or they thought they were going to offend somebody. Like that's never anybody's goal when they sign on to Star Wars. I feel like everybody understands the immense stage they're put on when they sign on to one of these projects. So I'm so excited about the current state. Um, the Acolyte, unfortunately, I wasn't the biggest fan of, and I think you mentioned the excitement around it. And I was initially so excited about the subject matter, you know, something we've never gotten to explore or see yet. Um, and I was excited and it fell a little short for me. I still watched it. I tuned in. But, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to like every single thing a Star Wars company production puts out. You know, everyone's going to have their opinions. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm in agreement with you. We watched it as well. Um, yeah. it. I I knew by episode three that, OK, well, I don't think this is the, you know, the show for me. Um, and this was during our transition, you know, moving from one place to another. Uh, we only covered the first we only reviewed the first four episodes. Um, and we never got a chance to review in the other because we were just so busy. But then when we're looking at what we were seeing, like, okay, well, 
we don't want this to be just Keith and Kerwin bashing the acolytes. So we just decided, okay, you know what, we'll just, um, we'll do a wrap up at the end. You know, once the season is over, uh, we'll talk about it in general. And then when the cancellation happened and we talked about, you know, our ideas for why it was canceled, something feels different though about this show than all the other Disney Plus series. Because if you think of it, Boba Fett and and Obi-Wan Kenobi, as far as we know, have not gotten a second season. And we never saw this type of backlash before, you know, this anger of, uh, you know, people saying, well, why did you cancel it? It was a great show. And then you have people on the other side saying, well, good, because it was terrible. Um, we didn't get that with the other series. So I don't know what happened here. I feel like the acolyte broke Star Wars, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I, it, um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah, fair. I think it, I, we're yeah. kind of in the same boat with you guys. Um, as far as reviewing the show and reacting to it, I think we got to episode right around the same time, episode three. I think it's when um, the space coven of witches was introduced. Yeah. It was like right around mm -hmm. that time. And like, I, I still had hope for it, right? Like, because I was in it to see Darth Plagueis and we did get to see him, spoiler alert, at the end. But it was just, it was so done by then. It was like an afterthought. And I feel like that should have been a huge chunk of it, you know? Like, I feel like the Acolyte, we all kind of know, not everybody viewing it, but like, if you do your basic little Google, Wikipedia sh search, you know what the content's going to be about. And there's so many ways they could go out about it. But I also initially thought that some of the High Republic characters were going to be a little bit younger. I didn't think they were going to be in an older, m more mature role, but I understand why they did that. But I think what tipped the iceberg for me was when uh, Jedi Master and Dara died in the first 10 minutes of the first yeah. episode. I was I was actually shocked. I had yeah. to rewind. I'm like, oh, she's not dead dead. Like, she's going to come back to life. Like, there's no way they would write Carrie Ann Moss off in the first episode. But they did. Um, <laughs> besides the flashbacks, which weren't enough. It was just like, how are, how are we doing this? How, like... What was the logic with writing her off so quickly? I get they were trying to tell a story, but I feel like there's so many other ways they could have told that story with still keeping her around just a little bit longer, maybe till episode three, you know? But. Yeah, yeah. I felt like they were pushing, you know, Carrie Ann Moss is going to be in it. Carrie Ann Moss, and, you know, if you've been around, you know about Carrie Ann and the Matrix and you know, her role as Trinity. Mm -hmm. Like, you saw her in Star Wars. Like, oh, I can't wait to see what she does. And whatever she did, she did it in five minutes and she was gone. You know, it's like, I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, what is going on? Um, I, yeah, but, that was, that hurt. That hurt to yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I didn't agree with the decisions that they made with the characters. You know, there were a lot of them and I felt that it was, it should have been more character driven and that didn't happen. Um, yeah. But yeah, so now I'm concerned about Star Wars because Usually, you know, they seem to have things in the pipeline um, as far as, okay, well, we have the next thing coming. And then after that, we have this. So we know Skeleton Crew is coming in December. But um, The Bad Batch, great animated series. I don't know if you watched that, but that ended in May. But there's no new animated series announced, you know, so I thought that was interesting. And then it looks to me you know, like they're... they're they're doing the opposite of what they did in 2019. They decided, okay, we're going to stop making the films and then, you know, stick to, you know, working with Disney plus, you know, bringing out projects on Disney plus. And now that, you know, they're taking a step back from Disney plus and saying, well, we'll start focusing on the, the new movies that are coming out, but we only know of one that's in production right now. So that's why I'm a little concerned. Like I, I don't know where they're going. Um, after next year, we have Andor, just one series. What do you think of the idea of them taking a step back and just maybe having one live action series per year? I I like that idea a lot, actually. Um, I, again, I'm so excited for all these projects. The different projects that they've announced for so many different people watching, again, like the viewers, they have the little, the kids show 
um the jedi adventures i believe it's called that show is like so cute and it's just i even i watch that as a 31 year old like i'll just turn it on you know and i'll just be like oh this is cute just check it out and then visions was incredible that was such an amazing show and i would love if they i think they are maybe it's a rumor um i heard they potentially are doing a season two of that um and then of course all the live actions which i think they just hit the jackpot with the mandalorian and it was just one of those things with time with COVID and Disney plus launching and the success of all their Marvel shows. And they just, they, they were perfect with that whole note and everything they did. But I think they took, they put too much on their plate. They got excited. We're all excited about all the shows, but it was a little oversaturated to the point where I was wondering if there was enough time spent in pre-production writing these shows, you know, cause it felt like they were hitting these people with deadlines just for this, that, 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 you know, because the Mandalorian was so hot and everybody was into it. And they're like, we have to get that second season. We have to get the third season. And I love the ideas of the book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan. That was one of the shows that I think should get a second season, you know? And I, I think it's a good thing if they slow down and kind of reassess everything and the feedback and, kind of take their time because I don't think there's really a time limit on telling this story. Um, Cause once you put it out there, you can't forget it. I know people are forgetting the newer star Wars trilogy movies. Like people say the rise of Skywalker doesn't even exist <laughs> anymore. Um, which I, I, you know, I'm 50 50 on it. Cause I like parts of it. Didn't love it overall. Felt really rushed, but I like, the idea of them realizing they can just take their time. Like it's okay if they slow down on just one show, one movie, even the movie, the Mandal, I think it's called the Mandalorian and Grogu, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not sold on the name. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. yeah. I, we know they're in it. We know they're in it, but like we couldn't Mandalorian something. Yes, totally. But like, and Grogu, I know, I'm not taking away from Grogu. I'm not taking away from Baby Yoda, okay? I love him. I'm obsessed. We all get it. But, like, the name isn't reminiscent of what the Mandalorian is or the things he's, he's done or the past he has. And I know Grogu is the future of Star Wars for sure, and that's obviously because they're making a lot of money on it too. But even with that movie announcement, I'm like, that's the name? You guys yeah. couldn't think of a better name. I'm gonna go watch it, but like, uh, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, have it's, all my it, money. yeah. But, it's a little yeah. lame. It is a, a lame title, but yeah, you know, it's like a cop out. You know, it's just yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I well, you know, they want people to know that the, you're gonna see the Mandalorian Grogu in this movie, and that's all you need to know. And that's I think you know, exactly. You know, we we know these characters so well. As long as they're in it, you know, we don't care what it's about. Although we do care. Of course, we don't want to just go watch a movie with Mandalorian Grogu and they're just walking around, you know, right. uh, from town to town. We don't want that. We want a story. Um, Absolutely. But yeah. You know, I, I, I'm a little spoiled and I, I really shouldn't be saying that, you know, because I lived in a time when there was no Star Wars between 1983 and 1999, you know, so 16 years of Star Wars. So I should be okay with them taking a break and having one series come out one year at a time, you know, but, you know, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I think you're right. I think it is the best thing to do is to really take a step back and just have a plan as to where, we want Star Wars to go. What type of stories we want to tell? Who are the characters? Um, mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, when we, you know, talking about this this episode, that it would be fun to put ourselves in the shoes of the Lucasfilm of the president of Lucasfilm. So you're you're the president of Lucasfilm. You know, we're co-presidents of the Lucasfilm. If we were the one, if we were asked, well, what type of stories or characters would you like to see in the animated series or in live action? What would the what would it be? What would the stories be? So what do you think, Tara? What, what would you like to see? Um, so I, I made a list. I don't know where to start on my list, right? Because I have some that are probably going to happen, I would say. 
like Andor season two, right? Like, mm -hmm. let me check my notes really quick because Andor just was one of the most moving Star Wars shows, Star Wars productions that I've ever watched. And I agree. I think yeah. I think we're all in agreement on that one, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, with it ending in this upcoming season, and obviously we all know what's going to happen because of Rogue One. We already kind of got that, you know, surprise ending already. It's a bittersweet show, but it's. Shows like that, that give us so much more context and emotion and just backstory to how insane the Empire is and just the things they were doing in their day by day. I think it just adds so much more depth to what was going on with the people existing in this galaxy. And I think it's bridged such a huge gap in this Star Wars timeline that I feel was completely necessary. At first it was like, oh, well, it was just a... It wasn't that long in between A New Hope or Revenge of the Sith. You know, Darth Vader's just stomping around, killing people, whatever. But I think it just showed so much more about the rebellion and the people that are fighting every day. And I, I feel like almost Star Wars has so many parallels with, like, modern-day regimes and empires, so to say, that you're kind of having, like, a light bulb moment when you're like, wow, like, this isn't too far off of what some people are going through today, depending on where they live. And it's kind of like a striking moment. It almost makes you more connected to Star Wars instead of the average person just walking by it and thinking, oh, it's about spaceships and laser beams and lightsabers, you know, stuff like that. But obviously, Andor season two, I'm really, really glad that if I was the president of Lucasfilm, I'm, I would be, all of our money would be going towards that. All of our money would be going towards promoting that because that is something I think everybody's bittersweetly looking forward to because we know what happens, right? But um, I think the first thing I would focus on or put in pre-production is some type of a Sith series. Now, we always get the perspective of the Jedi, the perspective of the people you want to win, right? And I'm all for that, right? Like at the end of the day, we all need that light. We need that hope. Totally get it. But I want to see, you know, a little Vader series. I want to see Vader in his prime, especially based off the comic book run they have going on right now. Like, it's an incredible comic. There are some incredible stories that could be told. And, I mean, Hayden Christensen, he's signed on. He's back, you know. And I know, unfortunately, James Earl Jones with his passing, it won't be the same at all. And I, I could see why that becomes an issue to want to continue on with Darth Vader and stuff. But I think he gave his blessing with everything they did with the prequels and just telling that backstory. And he understood that it was necessary to tell the story. But a Darth Vader series, just a mini series, like Obi-Wan, maybe six episodes just to see how people would like it. I think that would be really cool. Um, even a Darth Maul series. I just want to see maybe Plagueis, uh, Count Dooku, when he turns to the dark side. Like, I would want to tap into maybe the before times, maybe the, the Knights of the Old Republic, something like that, you know, where, like, we can really, like, feel the Sith's wrath, but also see why these Jedi sometimes turn to the dark side. I think that should be explored a little bit more, and... I think it could make for some really great TV, really great movie. Maybe who knows, you know? Yeah. I like that. I, I think you're onto something as far as a Sith. Yeah. I had an idea of that as well, because, um, you know, when you talked about the Sith, the first person I thought about was Asajj Ventress. Now, I don't know if you saw the last season of the bad batch, but yeah. you know, spoiler <laughs> alert, <laughs> have you seen yeah. it or should I not talk about it? Oh, no, I watched it, and my God, that was the best. The The episode yeah. she were, was in was just like, rewind, 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 I need more, I need more. Like, I wish they would, I wish you would have been in it more, you know? There's, like, so much potential there, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, right, and and we were surprised, of, you know, as far as the story lore, the lore goes, she's dead at this time, right? So now she's back, and we don't know how or why, and that's... You know, when they put her in the trailer for season three, we were thinking, OK, well, wow. I mean, this is amazing. Like they brought her back. Right. And I right. was hoping that they would tell us how it happened. And they didn't. <laughs> um, so I guess maybe they're still working on that story. But Fingers to me, crossed. that would be the next thing to put out for an animated series because you've already dangled that carrot. You know, you we know that she's back. 
So you have to tell us how she came back. So that should be the first, the first series, animated series after the Bad Batch that should be in development. And you're right. And she is a Sith or, well, we don't know what she is when she returns, but she does have Sith tendencies. Um, so mm-hmm. she would, you know, you could make her the protagonist, but then you would have somebody who's probably more evil than she is. And you could tell that story. You, you, now you're looking at, now you're rooting for Asajj Ventures rather than, you know, hoping that, you know, she gets, you know, uh, taken down by a Jedi. And I think that would make a great compelling story. Oh yeah, I feel like the greatest characters in Star Wars always have a bit of an anti-hero storyline to them. And Asajj Ventress's background is pretty traumatic, right? Like she was found as a young child, yeah. rescued, thrown into the Jedi. Some tragic things happened to her throughout her, you know, her Jedi career where she left. And like I feel like that would be such a strong female fronted role that people would really like see themselves in or align with because just look at the success of Ahsoka, you know, like I feel like they should be taking notes on, and I know people were indifferent about Ahsoka because it's such a specific character. And with that show, you did have to know a not a lot of backstory. They really tried to make it like obvious, but I think the more you know about her, obviously the better, but yeah, I, I feel like an Asajj Ventress storyline everybody would sign on for that as co-presidents of Lucasfilm. That would definitely be on the top five list. Um, I would absolutely push for a series with her. I would love to see her live action. You yeah. know, I, I think that would be really cool. I mean, the time she was alive, a lot of the characters they're exploring now were also alive too. So, I mean, I think it's very possible we could see her in live action, maybe far in the future, who knows? She was really powerful. And obviously with the Bad Batch, if you watch that episode, there is definitely some good left in her. And I think she's just, she doesn't want to be on a side, you know? She's just kind of like neutral. And I really respect that. And I think a lot of people would align with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like it. And she's a complicated character. She's come a long way and she's seen a lot. So She's not necessarily has to be good or bad. She just mm-hmm. needs to know, okay, well, I know I know right from wrong, you know? So, exactly. yeah, I think she would be a great character. Great character. Yeah. yeah. And I like the idea that you have of bringing back someone like a Darth Plagueis, you know, yeah. and talk about the, the rise of this, uh, you know, the rise of Plagueis and how uh, Palpatine rose to power and the story about him taking out Plagueis or, you know, well, before taking him out, learning about um, Plagueis and how to um, cheat death and to save your loved ones. I think that would also be a wonderful story to tell. I mean, it'll be a dark story, but, you know, I, I like dark stories. Same. And, and like, yeah. that's, yeah. that's like, I mean, I remember as a kid seeing the emperor and just being like terrified, like, who is this? And who's this guy? And he, he kind of always seemed like hidden, mysterious, shorter, like somebody you wouldn't be like, oh my God, you know, like, but when you hear him talk and you see the manipulation he uses and the control he has over people, you have to wonder how did he get to that point? And I feel like we deserve some type of backstory on, and it would be really interesting because, you know, the power of two with the Sith and just, him training in his younger years. And I mean, he was training Count Dooku. Like there's just so many different avenues they could explore. Even with like a young emperor show, I feel like they would do that one before a Plagueis or anything else, just because everybody knows the emperor and it would kind of like, just be easy to like copy paste it. But I feel like also while we're on this like topic of the before times from the prequels, a Knights of the Old Republic, like that is inevitable. I feel like within the next five years, we will 100% get some kind of announcement, some type of series. Everybody wants it. It is one of the best video games of all time. I watched that video gameplay on YouTube in my spare time and it's just, it's the best. And I feel like it would be so cool because they explored, not Knights of the Old Republic and Visions, but like, all the different avenues of Jedi and samurai and inspiration. And like, 
I feel like if they start building the foundation and making it stronger, everybody's going to like want to go back and watch like the, the prequels again. We're going to want to watch the original trilogy. We're going to want to see, oh, that makes sense why he did that or why the emperor does that or how he was influenced from somebody he was trained under and things like that, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, you mentioned it, I think that would make a great series is seeing Palpatine rise to power because we don't really know much about him as a child. Um, no. So I think him as the main character and, you know, whoever his political mentor was, like, where do you learn how to, to manipulate people? You know, where do you learn how to, to, to manage, you know, having two sides of, of the political, you know, two political parties and manipul manipulate them both. How do you learn how to do that? You know, someone had to teach him all this, you know, I think that would, he would, he would make an awesome character. And then, yeah. you know, yeah, a young Palpatine. You know, one thing um, I thought about, you know, if I was in charge of Lucasfilm, I, I think what Star Wars is trying to do, and I don't know if I agree with it, they're trying to distance themselves from Skywalker stories, which I don't think that's a good idea because the Skywalker family is the reason why we're still here talking about Star Wars. So... You know, you know, I hear people say, I don't want to hear any more stories about Luke or Leia or whatever. That's not me. I, I do want stories to continue, and especially now that we we have this gap. We still have this gap between episodes six and seven, 35 years of stories to tell. Um, and I, 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 I want to see at least, I'll start with an, an animated series, an animated series featuring Han, Luke, and Leia, and Chewie, and Lando, and what they're doing. Um, right after the fall of the empire. You know, I want to see about, um, you know, Han and Leia getting married, raising a family, you know, having Ben and, you know, maybe, you know, Luke's planting the seeds on whether he should train his nephew or not. Um, but I, what I do know, which I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the comic books starting next month, they're actually going to be talking about that era right after the fall of the empire they're going their, their series is going to be discussing the battle of jakku which took place right after so han luke and leia will be coming back and that's great in the comics but i think they should do more on the animated series side at least live action i think that's a little pushing it because you have to recast uh, mm -hmm. all the major characters but maybe an animated series where you have actors voicing the characters I think that's yeah. something that the uh, the Star Wars fans would go for. I think that's a great idea, especially just because Han, Luke, and Leia are just three different people. Like, I know Luke and Leia are twins, and they'll always have that connection. But, like, again, like, when somebody's watching this show, like, you know, Luke and all the trials and tribulations he goes through is not, I mean orphan i guess right technically i know he has parents and he has his uncle and his aunt but like he's constantly like questioning who he is and his identity and i think that would be almost maybe like a good like a uh, younger demographic show as well maybe like kind of like the bad batch in a way where they could explore kind of that but i mean after obi-wan season one which is another show i was gonna push for, you know, because we're co-presidents of Lucasfilm right now. I was going to say Obi-Wan needs a couple more episodes because it was, I will never forget, we were all at Star Wars Celebration. We ran into each other in California a couple years ago, and that was one of the best times ever because they were announcing so many different things. I believe that was the first time we got to see the Andor preview the Acolyte was announced. Um, John Williams came out and composed live. I will literally start crying thinking about that moment. It was amazing. But then that, remember that initial night, they showed the first couple episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I will never forget, I'm literally going to start crying, seeing little Leia. Uh, and just like, I mean, they, they grabbed at our heartstrings and they casted so incredible incredibly well um and even seeing little luke at the end there too so i think there's why plant those seeds of characters we've known and loved for the past 
almost 50 years and not pursue them. Like you already have the audience rooting for those characters and loving them no matter what. So I think it's definitely worth a shot to pursue their storylines, especially Leia. I think we all miss Padme. We didn't get enough of Padme, you know, and it was incredibly tragic. And to see Leia continue on and figure out her life and her path and seeing Padme in her is just the most beautiful thing to witness. And it would be really cool to see, it could almost be like a comedy, like WandaVision or something, like her, Han, raising little Ben. And Ben did have a sibling. He did have a sister. I don't know if that's going to like be canon. But um, going back to even just that, I would love to see a Kylo Ren origin story. I would love to see Luke in his kind of middle age there training Kylo at the Jedi Academy he's building when we see him. And um, was it the book of Boba Fett? Or I think, was it like that episode four, right? Yes, right. Yeah, with Grogu. Yes. yeah. Life-changing okay. episode again. Like Ahsoka and Luke in the same just can't even, I can't even fathom the emotions. Yeah. They're all coming back to me, but just to see him maybe exploring that relationship with Ben before he becomes Kylo and everything that happened. Cause we know there was so many tragic events with his Jedi training Academy and, you know, his thoughts got the best of him. And even somebody as profound as Luke Skywalker, you know, the ultimate good in the Star Wars galaxy, the one Jedi everybody looks to, even he had that moment of doubt and the dark side kind of came over. And like, I think it would be really relatable for a lot of people. And I think people would love to see that explored because we also didn't get enough of Kylo Ren, to be completely honest. And he's, he's one of my favorite characters. And like, I would absolutely love to see like, him growing up in that, maybe not a whole series, but then jumping to like the Knights of Ren and seeing how he gets to where he is, you know? Yeah. That could be a good book. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. I, I like your idea, especially of back Obi-Wan Obi. Um I, yeah, I think maybe it it uh, off well. Rather than bring back Vader, I don't think you can because, you know, they're not going to meet again until New Hope. Right. But you have Darth Maul, right? So he can be your your antagonist. Uh, you can have a story of him still looking around for Obi-Wan Kenobi, maybe somehow bring in, you know, what Maul is doing at this time where he's forming Crimson Dawn, you know, the, uh, the, the criminal organization with Kira. And you know maybe yeah. you can you know bring back Kira to live action, and you have Darth Maul as the main villain, and Obi Wan Kenobi, and then they can recreate the showdown between the two of them on Tatooine that took place in Rebels. Please, yeah. <laughs> I mean we have Ahsoka right there too. Like exactly. Rosario yeah. Dawson would completely be down for that. Like, and such a great casting with Kira um, as. Um, Gosh, her name's escaping me right now. But um, Amelia Clark, I think. Amelia, Amelia Clark. Clark. Mm -hmm. um, an, an amazing actor. Um, that would be incredible. I personally, I love that you brought that up because I love the solo movie. I thought that was such a great change of pace from a serious Star Wars movie, which it was serious in the ways it needed to be. But I mean, who, I, I always get frustrated when people say they didn't like that movie because I'm like, we're literally watching the origin story of Chewbacca and Han Solo meeting, and it's just beautiful, you know? So I think that would be cool. The Crimson Dawn. Oh, I love Darth Maul. Another character we didn't get enough of, but I feel like every character we're listing, we're hitting all the notes. Everybody would want to see more of them, especially because, exactly. I mean, yeah, even with um Solo and going from that, like Lando, I know there was supposed to be the Lando show and I'm, I don't think that's going to happen anymore. I think I saw like an announcement like a couple months ago saying that's not happening. And I'm really yeah. upset about that because another character that's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little confused about that because originally the Lando series was supposed to be, you know, Disney plus series. And then they decided they were going to make it into a movie 
and you know Donald Glover and his brother were going to write it and and I don't know if that is still happening but but I do know that the Disney Plus series is 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 out so I don't know you know I know recently they had an interview with I think I don't know if he was going to be the producer on the series and he says well there isn't going to be a series but he didn't mention anything about the movie so I don't know if that's happening either yeah maybe he hasn't written it out yet I would love we come on like how how could you drop the ball that bad yeah. have Donald Glover sign on to play Lando Calrissian and then not do it I just feel like that's yeah. embarrassing that's almost yeah <laughs> that's yeah. like comically embarrassing to not pursue that because he is just such a tremendous creator he's an incredible actor and I feel like I I trust him a lot in terms of harnessing that character, Lando. And like Billy D Williams is still around and he would absolutely give his blessing and just be there to help like, you know, chip in. And I think a Lando movie would almost be like coinciding with a solo movie and it would just be so fun and to see, because he's again, a person that we don't know a lot about a person's story that deserves to be told because of everything he's done and how respected he is. Even in the solo movie, he's just, Donald Glover did such a good job. Like, I feel like when we saw him in the solo movie, I'm probably going to watch that tonight now because I haven't watched it in a while. And I'm having flashbacks to that like gambling scene when you meet Lando and he has his like cape and his whole getup. And I'm just like, this is exactly what I had in my mind and they personified it and did it so perfectly. So that I think a Lando show would also make my top five list. Cause yeah. that would just be fun. Like everything doesn't have to be critical dark versus light, like star Wars, epic trilogy stuff. Like we can have those one-off movies and those one-off productions that just bring us joy because we love the universe. We love the galaxy, you know? I think people would really respond well to that. Yeah, see, that, that's the thing with Star Wars. I mean, you have so many characters, and, you know, I, I have no idea how many Star Wars characters are out there. There's hundreds of characters. There are so many books, novels, comics out there. There is material. There's a lot of information out there. And for whatever reason, you know, you know, well, for as far as I know, they're not going to these existing novels or comic books and maybe saying, hey, well, this will make a good story. Let's adapt this. I mean, Lost Stars, you know, or Bloodline by Claudia Gray, two great books um, that they can, you know, just take that, adapt it and create something out of it or animated or live action series. So it's right there. You know, you just need to hire a writer, you know, but uh, maybe that is what Star Wars is doing right now. I mean, they they probably have all these, they probably have many ideas in development right now, but I guess it's just a matter of bringing the, the right talent together and having this done. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, it's an unfair comparison, but I'm always thinking about how Marvel does it versus Star Wars. And you know how Marvel over time just brought out these new characters in different movies and they had up to two to three movies come out per year. And, you know, some of them, you know, were hits, some of them were misses, but they kept going, you know what I mean? And, you know, they, yeah. they, 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 they had something in, in mind. Well, if this didn't work, okay, well, we'll give them this. And they had a plan, you know, as to where they needed the story to go. Right. So it's this number of movies, these number of characters that had to be in it because we need to take it here. I don't think Star Wars has that. So I, I think maybe that's what we're looking for from them. Um, and so if they had a plan as to where they want to go, maybe they do. Um, but um, I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that, that's interesting you bring that, that point up about Marvel because at the end of the day, I mean, the Mandalorian writing room is probably next to... Captain America, Brave New World's writing room, like they're down the street from each other. And it really is interesting because I feel like they're at the same even level of caliber of people just caring and respecting the, the canon stories and 
diving into all of the theories and everything like that. And, you know, I've had a couple arguments the past couple months myself about the direction Marvel's going with because they're doing movies that aren't, um, so to say, larger than life or just following the same story plan that they've done since Infinity War or Endgame. And I think it's really important that they explore these different avenues and these different characters because at the end of the day, when everybody comes together or the whole book, so to say, is finished on these movies, it's going to coincide with everything that's been going on. And it's really going to come together cohesively. But I feel like we live in a society that's just like, I want it now. I want this now. And like, I get why Disney Plus and Marvel and everybody over there is just like pushing to promote and like get everything out as quickly as they can because you've got to do it when it's popular or it's hot because people will forget, you know, we unfortunately live in a society that is kind of like that now and they'll move on to the next best thing. But, you know, and, and the famous last words of Star Wars, the one thing we learned the first movie we watched, you know, like we still have hope for it. And I feel like there's still from just the things we've discussed, like, gosh, they need to add us. Like, I don't even want to check. I don't want to check. I just, I want to have a conversation. And me and Ilsa on Relatable Nerds, we always have this joke where we say we've done been knowing or John Favreau is listening and Kevin Feige is listening. And it's a joke, but like you could kind of predict in a positive way, maybe what they'll choose. And I think, I think they would benefit if we would just, come on for a week and just you know help them out maybe they need that little push you know <laughs> yeah. that is an excellent point because i do believe that kevin feige listens to the fans you know of course he's not going to come out and say well hey i heard the fans i'm going to give you what you want but i think he he checks the temperature of the fans uh, so when he knows when something is going well he's going to say okay well this was pretty good let's do more of this or yeah. something doesn't go well. Say, so, okay, well, you know, let's step back and you know, we'll we'll go we'll go in this direction. I wonder if Star Wars is doing the same thing. I, are they even listening to us? Um, and if not, I think they should. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you don't have to acknowledge that you know you're listening to the fans, although we would enjoy you saying that. But you know, you don't have to. But we would know by your actions, right? You know, right. so you. You know, you, 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 you return, you say, well, here's a plan for the three films, you know, the three films that they announced just last year, you know, we haven't heard a word about them, you know, like, so what happened if they were to come back and say, well, here's what we're doing with these three films. Here's who's in it. This is when it's coming out. This is how it's going to connect to the larger Star Wars universe. I think the, the fans will be quickly on board with that. So who knows? Maybe they'll listen one day. I, I, you know, I, I always give them the benefit of the doubt because I know it's probably so immensely complicated and difficult for them to just filter through all of the opinions and things they're hearing from people constantly. But like you said, at the end of the day, like this may be selfish to say, but it should be almost a little bit of a fan service as well because the fans wouldn't, the people on there just just like we're doing, just people on Twitter. I know there's a lot of people, negative opinions. Obviously, this doesn't this doesn't pertain to them. But the people that are out there that are giving their honest reviews and opinions about Star Wars, all the small channels, all the small podcasts that I listen to, they bring me so much joy because it's just the details and like the little things that would just make you or I or any other Star Wars fan through the roof happy. Like it would make our whole entire, you know, like just little things that they could do. And again, I know it's probably insanely difficult with just budget production, finding people to play these roles as well. I can't imagine how hard it is to cast, but I, they've done so much good with the new star Wars movies um, and the shows. There's so much good in a pile of, of unknown opinions or like mismatched thoughts. And they're trying, I feel like they're trying to connect the dots. They want to do something. I mean, the Obi-Wan show, I often, whenever I get, like when I was watching The Acolyte and I was kind of in a negative state of mind, 
And it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to stop watching Star Wars or I'm not going to support it. Even after the Mandalorian and Grogu little announcement, like, I, I'm not going to not watch it. I was a little like, uh, I think you or I could have came up with a better, you know, movie title. But I think they're trying because of the little things they've done, right? Like, they gave us an Obi-Wan show. I We got to see Hayden Christensen again as Darth Vader. Like, after a slew of people before social media existed were just disrespecting him and hating on the prequels. And I feel like I've been going to bat for this man my whole life. Like, I've just been like, give him a chance. Like, it's not his fault. Like, Darth Vader's a complicated character. Anakin Skywalker, we didn't even cover all of the complicated things this man has been through. Unless you watch The Clone Wars, you obviously have a better idea. But I think they're trying to give us something. They're giving us hope because that Ahsoka show, too. Um, I know, you know, I'm surprised when I talk to people my co-host especially, she didn't really love the Ahsoka show, and I was shocked to hear that. I wasn't obsessed, but I really, really appreciated everything they did. I mean, to see Thrawn finally in live action, that was such a fan service, and it, was, it wasn't the best received, but I think they went about it the best way they could. Um, so I hope that's another show I would add on to Ahsoka season two. I hope we get that one. I know you guys are big fans of Ahsoka. I know Keith loves Ahsoka too. So I'm rooting for that show because there's just still so much more story to be told. And Ahsoka, such a complicated, amazing, confident character that you want to be around in the Star Wars universe and the future of it. Because again, so many people look up to Ahsoka and so many people love her story rightfully so it's very inspiring and she always did the good thing even if it hurt her in the end and i think her unselfishness is such a good motif and something that star wars could definitely keep building on and i want to see more thrawn maybe a selfish answer i hope we get to see more thrawn too even hera everybody little jason sandula like i just I think there's so much potential there and they're trying to give us that. It's not quite there yet, but I think they're on the right path. You know, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the rumor is that there will be a season two. Um, they're going to start shooting in 25, which means we'll probably get season two coming out in 26. So, so in 2026, you'll have the Grogu Mandalorian Grogu movie and you'll have Ahsoka well, and that'll be nice. I mean, you'll have one movie, one TV series. That that could work out. You know, we have to wait a few more years to get it, but you know, it'd be worth it if they're both success. You know, and like you like you said earlier, you know, we'll always be Star Wars fans. We're gonna root for it. You know, whether we like it, great. If not, all right, we'll just move on to the next thing. You know, so I, I know for me, I, I'll never give up watching our Star Wars. Yeah, Sam, I'll never give up hope. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. That's yeah, exactly yeah. right. So. You know, that Ahsoka, that Ahsoka Mandalorian movie could go hand in hand, you know? Yeah. Since we've seen Mandalorian and Ahsoka together already, and they have really good chemistry, um, I think the fans want to see more of that. And it was such a good tease that I think people were counting on maybe to see him in the Ahsoka series. And we didn't, and that's fine. Um, cause they have so many incredible avenues to still explore, but I feel like without a doubt, she's, she's going to be in the Mandalorian movie. Yeah. There's like almost no hesitation. And that's the only thing that's keeping me here for the Mandalorian movie is that Ahsoka is going to be in it and bo is going to be <laughs> like, that's why I'm mad at the name. Cause there's just so much more going on in the background, you know? Yeah. But that's a very good point. You're right. Because it, they all. They both series takes place in the same timeline. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they have to connect. Good point. Yeah. yeah. They got right, something well, there. Yeah. <laughs> we will see, you know. So like I said, we'll have to wait a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, at, at least we have skeleton crew at the end of the year. We'll have Andor yeah. next year. So we still have a lot to talk about. Yeah, I'm excited for Skeleton Crew. I Me think too. that's gonna be a really cool show. I mean, um, at the end of the Bad Batch, one of the hypotheses, things we guessed on was that 
Omega will show up in the skeleton crew. I think a lot of people, there's been some discourse about that. And I think, I think we need to see a couple characters from the Bad Batch in a live action series or pop up somewhere at this point. Um, eventually, you know, maybe Andor. They're around during Andor. I would love to see Clone Troop 99 do something, you know, with Cassian and maybe just get in there because they're rebels too. And like, I just want to see some crossovers happen that would make my little Star Wars fan heart so happy. <laughs> but Skeleton Crew looks fun. I'm excited for Skeleton Crew. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So, uh, what I want to do is spend the, the last few minutes and talk about James Earl Jones. Um, so we lost the iconic actor uh, with the booming baritone voice. You know, we, as we know, Star Wars fans know him as um, he voiced one of the greatest villains of all time, Darth Vader. James Earl Jones died September 9th at the age of 93. Um, so what I did was I went back and I watched, uh, there's a two hour, well, two and a half hour documentary called The Empire of Dreams on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I don't know if you watched it, but I highly recommend it if you didn't. Uh, but yeah, so they interviewed James O. Jones and he talked about, you know, how he was hired, why he was hired for the role. And he said that George had hired David Prowse, but he wanted a so-called darker voice, not in terms of ethnic, but in terms of timber. And the rumor is he thought of Orson, Orson Welles. So George Lucas wanted to hire Orson Welles. And then probably thought that Orson might be too recognizable. So what he ends up, so what he ends up with is taking a, a voice that was born in Mississippi, raised in Michigan, and was a stutterer. And that happened to be my voice. And that was James O. Jones. So that was um, how he became Darth Vader. You know, that was the voice. Um, it's I, I I don't know, you know, what you can say about James O. Jones. Like one of the things I noticed when I went back and, you know, I was just watching old interviews when they talked about Darth Vader. And he really, he was very humble about the role as if I didn't, as if he didn't bring anything to the, to the character, like the role, he was just a voice and the voice is nothing, you know, is, which is not, is, is, is <laughs> insane that he, he thinks that way that, you know, he's, he, he thought of it, his voice was just a special effect. Like he really didn't bring much to the character. Um, but he was so pleased to be a part of the legend. Um, and he thought of himself as an observer, you know. But we know better than that, that mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that voice, that Darth Vader would not be the menacing, uh, manipulative uh, character that we see on the screen. Um, he is... You know, what you know, I don't know. I'm at a loss for words about James O. Jones. What, what do you want to say about James O. Jones? What, is, what does he mean to you and, and to Star Wars? It is a tremendous loss, especially when you, whenever anybody passes, right? The first thing somebody does is try to honor their memory, and we go back to their quotes and we go back to their history and their everything, the documentaries and stuff. And just he was just so incredibly humble. And just like you said, he didn't even think he brought a lot to the character or the story, which is just mind blowing because that was the first recognizable voice I ever knew in my life. And it was partly Star Wars, but it was partly in other roles he had, like The Lion King. Yeah. That was my favorite movie as a child. Mufasa was just one of the most tremendous voice roles of all. Arguably his voice is one of the most recognizable voices of all time. And I, it's, it's just tremendously sad to think that that has passed on and we will never get to hear him again in future projects. And I know they have AI and all of that wacky stuff, but it'll never be the same and it is just such an incredible loss. And I, I'm at a loss for words too, because you just, you think back to all the times throughout your life when you, when you see James Earl Jones and all of the movies he's done, the voice work and even little TV shows appearances he's done as himself. Um, I was exploring that before we talked today. 
And um, he just always seemed like somebody you wanted to know in real life. Yeah. Like he would be the guy you could go up to if he was just sitting at a cafe or a restaurant. You just shake his hand and start talking to him. And it, it would just, he would be so incredibly really kind and humble and everything. Yeah. From the movies that he's done, you know, like, like you said, the Lion King and coming to America, he has such a comedic timing, you know, like, you know, he was hilarious in coming to America. And then, uh, you know, he had uh, guest roles on Frasier and and uh, uh, the Big Bang Theory. You know, he, he, he did a lot. And I was a big fan of L.A. Law. I remember that he played an attorney, um, a, a defense attorney. Um, and he, you know, he whenever he's on screen, it's like you can't take your eyes off of him. Like he's such a big presence, you know, not just his voice, but physically, you know, like he commands the room you know and um yeah so he, he's a he's a wonderful actor um yeah, yeah i just want to what i want to do is just go back and watch his older movies um that I, I have not seen or movies that i haven't seen in such a long time yeah i um i definitely need to take the time to do that as well because just caught you off guard, you know, when you see those those announcements on social media. I, I had a couple of friends text me because they all know I'm like just, you know, the Star Wars nerd and the group of friends. Right. There's always one. I'm sure you're the one I'm, you know, but it was like I couldn't even believe it. And then to share that news with my father, too, was just like heartbreaking and. Um, he came over and we, we didn't watch any of the movies or anything, but we were just talking about our favorite Darth Vader moments, coming to America, Mufasa, the Lion King, um, um, what's the baseball movie? Um, Field of, Field of Dreams? Field of that, Dreams, oh yeah, absolutely. Field of Dreams, Field of the Dreams. Sandlot, the yeah, Sandlot yeah. was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Um, it was just one of those voices I remember as a kid watching, like you never connected the dots that you knew it was familiar. I feel like when you listen to James Earl Jones speak or you saw him, you were just like, oh, like I know him. Like it's a familiar, inviting, friendly voice. There's always that tone of just like, hey, like I like this guy. Like I, I know who he is, you know, and um it was one of those things I never realized as a kid with the voices like Mufasa. I didn't realize that until I was probably like nine or 10 or whatever. But when you put it all together, it makes perfect sense, you know? And he was just a larger than life actor. And, you know, I, I think people like him that pass on before they go, they never realize the uh, profound influence they'll have not only on this generation because of how humble they are and future generations. I mean, he's going to be the number one person in everybody's book to look up to. When you think of a voice actor, when you think of an actor, of somebody you want to portray as it's, it's James Earl's Joan and it's a high pedestal to reach. But at the same time, when you think about how friendly and kind and inviting he was, it just, it just makes you feel good inside about Hollywood when it doesn't really feel like a good and good place all the time. You know, he feels like he was one of the good ones mm -hmm. and we should honor him any chance we get. Yeah. Yeah. And that has a lot to do with perfect casting. You know, yeah. George, you know, I, I don't know how George Lucas heard of James Earl Jones, I guess, you know, because he he was doing films at the time and he just heard his voice and said, well, that's that's Darth Vader. That's how he needs to sound. Um, Light bulb. Yeah, exactly. And, and as Vader, he has some of the best lines, you know, throughout the films and the TV series. So, you know, and, and he didn't have a lot of lines, but the lines that he said, you know, like you're like on the edge of your seat every time he talked, he said something. Um, so like, do you have a favorite Darth Vader line? Yes. I have more than one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many, right? Yeah. And like, I feel like I I hold like Darth Vader too. I feel like so as a kid, um, Darth Vader was always my favorite Star Wars character. Like I was always the weird kid that loved Darth Vader when everybody was afraid of him. And they're like, "How do you like him? And you don't like Luke Skywalker? Don't get me wrong, I love Luke Skywalker, 
But my dad was gracious enough to like never tell me the full storyline before I watched the prequels because I saw Star Wars at a young age. And then when the prequels came out, I was a little bit older. And then you connect all those dots. So for me, it was like seeing his timeline between Hayden Christensen and his older self. So I almost, I feel like they're both just so on the same wavelength of playing this character that it just transcends perfectly into like the original movies from the prequels. But my favorite one, I'm trying to get the direct quote, but um, it's the aspirations quote with the, uh, that's my favorite one. <laughs> that's the one I hear like in my head. Um, don't, don't choke on your aspirations. Director yeah. or uh, general or Direct something. Critic, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> that one's great. Um, yeah. The Empire Strikes Back. Um, when he goes, he's as clumsy as he is stupid. That's yeah. a good one. Um, but, you know, I feel like the number one everyone is going to say is, Luke, I am your father. Right? Um, and that was... That was the memory. That's like the key lock in. And I don't know, I, I guess as a kid, I was always like, why is this guy so mad all the time? Like who hurt him? Like, I don't know. There's something about him. I don't, I don't believe all of this. Like, I don't think he's just angry and upset for a reason, not justifying anything he did, but like, even with James Earl Jones, just voicing that, I feel like I was still like, huh? Like, I wonder if you catch this Darth Vader guy on a good day. How is he going to be? You know, I feel like he's just, when Star Wars was filming, he was just having off days, you know? He was just in a bad mood, you know? But, like, if you catch him on a good day, you know, the first of the month when he's happy, you know, maybe when summer's, well, probably not summer starts. I mean, he didn't have the great situation after Mustafar with the getup. But yeah. I feel like he wasn't always, he, he I just see Anakin in him when I see Darth Vader. And that's just probably because of my age and the way I watch Star Wars. But <sighs> there's so many good moments. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ranting. because No, that, that's, that's you, you actually touched on a good point. You know, in the first film, you know, in, in A New Hope, you know, yeah. we didn't know much about him. We just knew that he was mean. He was a villain and he wanted to hurt people. Mm -hmm. Right. And, but it wasn't yeah. until he delivered that line, you know, when he we you know, we really didn't know what was fueling him. Why does he want Luke so badly? Well, I mean, OK, he blew up the Death Star. Get over it. You know, why do you keep going after this? Luke? Over it. <laughs> why are you going after this guy? I mean, what did he what else do you want from him? And then right. we find out that it's personal. And then when he delivers that line, I am your father. I mean, Every time I hear it, no matter how many times I've watched The Empire Strikes Back, whenever he delivers that line, I get chills. And I've heard it so many times. Like, well, what's the big deal? But it, it's something about the way it was delivered. Um, like it just turned Darth Vader into a human character. It, it humanized him, you know, rather than just this tyrant machine. Wow. There's a man underneath that mask. There's a man underneath that suit. Yeah. And I, f I feel like I always, it always didn't sit well with me that the emperor was the guy who was like running the ship. Right. For so like, I always remember as a kid, like I was just like, I don't buy what this guy is selling. Like, I just don't know. I feel like Darth Vader just is so much more powerful than this guy. And he's just holding back. But is he, why is he holding back? You know? And you realize as you get older, like, yeah, that's because he wants to have this relationship with his son. And he's yeah. obviously torn from having that relationship because of everything that happened to him and the way the emperor manipulated him as Anakin, you know, and that transcended into everything. And I always just, I don't know, I guess I was just always a believer. I was always <laughs> believing Darth Vader was going to take the mask off and show us who he really is and he does and I, I remember watching return of the jedi and just being like i knew it <laughs> like i knew he wasn't gonna i knew he wasn't gonna be bad i knew he wasn't gonna hurt luke like how do you hurt luke that's your son and you're gonna hurt luke no way especially after luke's comeback in return of the jedi after training with yoda and there's just so much story there but yeah, it was just anytime he was on screen, it was captivating. You couldn't look away. I don't think I was ever blinking. Um, 
just that voice. I again, I don't realize. I don't think he realized the power he had over people in such a humble way. Playing like because it's James Earl Jones, this kind person when he's not voicing Darth Vader, but when he starts getting there and he's voicing him, it's like, oh my gosh, like what's going on? You know, like you're just like. I feel like there's some good still in his voice. Like you can just sense that good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's, he, it's a wonderful character. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the empire strikes back is my favorite film and Damn. there's tons of lines in there, but I don't think anyone is better than uh, in the carbon freeze when he reneges on the deal with Lando. And, you know, the plan was that, you know, Lando, was going to keep Leia and Chewbacca on Cloud City. But then mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Darth Vader said, well, put them on my ship. And then Lando says, well, wait a minute. You know, you said that they'd be safe here. And he says, I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. And like, that was <laughs> amazing. I don't know if you caught, caught it, but when that line was delivered, you saw Billy D. Williams grab his throat <laughs> as if, just thought I, I was going to get force choked, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, like he was either, either feeling it or he was thinking, okay, well, you know, I, what's going to happen? <laughs> you know, if I, if I cross him again, that's it. But it was it was wonderful. It was delivered wonderfully. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything about it, the lighting and, and the, the the words and the acting from both sides, it, it was great. Um, and um, I, you know, we're going to have his voice forever. You know, it's not going away. You know, if you're watching the films, it's as if he's still here, you know, so. Yeah, it'll transcend so, for sure. Yeah, for exactly. So uh, yeah. thank you so much, James O. Jones, you know, for, for all you've given us so many years and so many fantastic movies and that, that boy, that voice, you know, that will never go away. So, so this was, this was cool. Thank you so much. Of course, yeah. thank you for having me. I I haven't really gotten to uh, dive into my love for James Earl Jones and Darth Vader or really just kind of grieve it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I've had my conversation with my father, but, like, nobody really gets that in my life, I would say. Like, when you're nerding out about, you know, a, a, a character you love your whole life passing, you know? It's just, it's one of those things that's almost like, no one ever wants to be haunted, right? No one mm. ever wants to ghost following around them. But I feel like I'm, I'm always hearing this guy in my head. Is I'm always hearing some Darth Vader like you know voice in my head, and and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's like the the devil angel on the shoulder. He could be either or, right? Yeah. But it it was so much fun to nerd out about him because, like I said, I haven't gotten to properly grieve grieve him yet. I haven't had my Star Wars marathon yet, you know. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. I haven't had time to. I'm yeah. like, what am I going to watch? I need to watch the show yeah. that we have in pre-production as co co uh, co presidents of Lucasfilm. Um, exactly. I need to watch that. I need to start <laughs> writing that Darth Vader series. You know, That's it. I always joke too on that note about a Mace Windu series. I know this is totally off topic, but I have the first four episodes of a Mace Windu series. I forgot to say that written out. If anyone's listening. <laughs> Really? Give me a chance. Oh yeah, I. That's another character that would be around while Darth Vader's around, and I yeah. think it would be a tremendous. I I don't think Darth Vader would do anything if he saw him. He would just be like whatever. Like he would know he's there. He would sense it because obviously Mace would be in hiding. But I think Darth Vader would just be like, I kind of, I kind of did that to you. <laughs> before this, you know, get up I have now and like my bad dude. I like I feel like they would just have this like we're even now, like you can walk kind of moment, you know? Like it's fine, we're even, you know? But yeah. Things I, I think of randomly. <laughs> um that's interesting you brought that up because um I've asked this question to Mark Bernardin. Uh you know, he wrote the he recently uh wrote a a, a Mace Windu series. That mm -hmm. came out earlier this year. And oh, gotta... I'm going to ask you the same question I asked him. Do you think Mace Windu survived the fall? In yes. Reverse? You do? Okay. 100%. So still, no hesitation. He's still around. I think 
Now, if it would have been like prequel era times, yeah, before we got all of these shows in the comics and the stories, probably not. Like as a kid, I was like, "That's a big loss." Like uh, that one still hurts; it still stings. And but now I'm like, "There's no way he's dead. There's no way he died." I think he's kind of he escaped, kind of like Yoda did, you know, and. We've seen in Clone Wars, uh, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, people, Coruscant is like many different lanes of traffic. So you could fall and land on something and most likely survive. And Mace Windu was an incredibly powerful Jedi. He was Yoda's second man, you know, right hand man. And to me, it's just, there's no way he died. What, he got a little bit of a shock? Look at the Emperor. He got shocked, too, and he survived. And <laughs> I know he got a couple limbs cut off, whatever. But, like, <laughs> to me, it's it's also, like, tremendous casting. Yeah. I don't think Samuel L. Jackson is going to go out like that. You know? <laughs> I think he's going to live. But Mace Windu was one of my favorite characters as a kid because his lightsaber was purple, the attack of the clones when they enter the Coliseum and he goes, this party's over and just axes off Django Fett. Like that was just like one of those moments. I remember I was in the theater with my father and we got the last two seats that night to see Star Wars. And this was back in the day. I'm obviously remember when the, the movies would come out on like a Tuesday. Hmm. It was like not on a Friday or a Thursday. It was like a Tuesday night. It was a school night. My mom was so mad. And we got the last two seats in the theater and I had never to this day have an experience like that in my life where everybody was just standing up, clapping, cheering. And I'm this little eight-year-old girl just like, oh my God, this, these are my people. And I didn't even realize it. But when Mace Windu walks in that Coliseum and he says, this party's over, everybody stood up and started cheering and clapping. My dad was a, knocked his whole popcorn thing over. like, And it was a thing where I was just like, okay, like let me stand up. And we were just cheering for Mace Windu. And I think the environment helped me loved him even more, but Mace Windu is still alive. That's another thing that should be explored because we, yeah, there's no way he passed. There's no way he passed. I think he escaped. He knew what was happening before it was going to happen. Yeah. He probably gave Yoda a little bit of a heads up, but obviously you don't see that in the movie. Um, but then you can see it more explored in Clone Wars. Like Mace Windu was onto something. Yoda knew, but I feel like they were all just, it's almost like they were too oblivious on purpose. Yeah, but um, I would. That's another show I would think about pre-production for a Mace Windu live action, or maybe just even throw him in some other show. Like, just have him appear. Like, can you imagine the response to that? Like, that Samuel would, yeah. Jackson is still with us. Yeah, yes, he is, and he would be up to it. I'm, I'm, I, I know it. He would love to come back as Mace. Well, there was that. There was that interview last year. Um, they did like a whole, cause they brought Hayden Christensen back for Obi-Wan and everything. And like, there was so much excitement about the prequels. Yeah. And I think it was the 20th anniversary. It might've been two years ago when um, Star Wars Celebration was in 2022, but there was um, the 20th anniversary of Attack of the Clones. And they did like a whole segment and spread in Entertainment Magazine, I believe it was. And Mace Windu was interviewed, or Samuel Jackson was interviewed and he was talking about it. And I'm like, as soon as I saw that, I think I could still pull up my like tweet that I made. I'm like, oh, this is settled. He's back. <laughs> like this, this needs to happen now. Come on, you can't give us that, but not give us Mace Windu in something. Like even just to hear his name in something or like something happened, it wouldn't fulfill me. But yeah, I feel like if him and Darth Vader cross paths, it would just be like neutral. Darth Vader would be like, hey man. I really messed you up that one time. You were on to something. You caught me, you know, and I messed up. And Darth Vader clearly regrets it because he's in this suit now that right. sucks, you know. Um, and, yeah, he probably is, would just let him go. He would be, like, looking the other way. But Sam, Mace Windu would know that he sees him. But yeah, Darth but Vader just wouldn't say anything. He would just be, yeah, everything's exactly. fine here. Let's keep moving. Right, yeah. yeah, I think Anakin would keep it cool, like, okay, he doesn't know it's me under this suit. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to tell him. Yep. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, it would just be completely cool, like, yeah. okay, we're even now. <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting to think about. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we'll have to pick up this story uh, some other time. This is good. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Definitely. <laughs> Where can people find you? 
All right. Um, so we are relatable nerds. Me and my co-host Ilsa, um, relatable nerds on just about everything. Uh, YouTube, Instagram, trying to pursue TikTok, but that is just not going well for us. So we might pause on that. But mostly YouTube. Uh, we react to a lot of Star Wars content, especially coming up with Andor season two next year. Currently, we'll be covering Agatha, House of Harkness, a couple Marvel shows in there probably touch base about skeleton crew as well and i feel like we're now focusing more on marvel because there's a lot of good marvel productions coming out at the end of the year we got craven the hunter uh venom 3 those are sony movies but you know i think we're getting back to a spider-man discourse sooner than later which yeah. makes our hearts very happy you know it's like you can't get away from luke skywalker you can't get away from spider-man peter parker is the the person you want to see and everything is the ultimate good and just bad things happen to him. Just like Luke Skywalker. I feel like that could be a whole little parallel, you know, Luke Skywalker and Peter Parker just going through some of the same trials and tribulations, but yeah, yeah. relatable nerds on everything. <laughs> I would love that. Luke Skywalker and Spider-Man, they're both going to outlive all of us. So, you know, I'm here for it. <laughs> Well, this is Father Sun Galaxy. You you can find us on Instagram, X, and Facebook. Uh, we have a website. You go to fathersongalaxy.com. Our email address is k e y a r d e at fathersongalaxy.com. So you can reach out to us, you know, through the socials or through email. You know, we're easy to find, and we also have a YouTube channel. All right. So thank you very much, Kyra Navarrete from Relatable Nerds. This is fun. I'm, I'm, I enjoy always talking to you because you are a geek and those are the people I hang out with. <laughs> those are the people I enjoy talking to. So thank you. Of course. We got to write that script about Mace Windu or maybe the, um, the, the, the Darth Vader series or the Crimson Dawn series. We're working on it. John right. Favreau, if you're listening, we're working Sounds on good it. To me. Hey, that's right. Well, we're the president of Lucasfilm, so he has to listen to what we have to say. <laughs> gotta give us our time, you know. We just gotta give us our accolades. We deserve it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you once again. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Of course. Okay. All right. Bye. That is it. Thank you so much, everyone. So until next time, take care, and we will see you again. <laughs>